Hello and welcome to the House of Prayer. Today we're going to continue our series on the names of God with a look at Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. And I don't care what's going on in your lives at the moment. I believe that by the time this session is ended, you will have the peace of God within you. Say amen. Now before we begin any of that, we're going to open our hearts and minds to God. Close your eyes, open those hearts, and let's worship along with our brother Marvin, who's here with us tonight. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Just as you are before your God, God. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you want to worship. Come. Just as you are before your. Willingly we choose to surrender our lives Willingly our knees will bow With all our heart, soul and mind and strength We gladly choose you now Come, now is the time to worship Now now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before your God. We ask you, Holy Spirit of God, to blow, blow till the breath of your Spirit blows into me, Lord. Pull this earth, Lord. Bring it, Lord, to birth. And blow, Lord, where you will. Spirit of God and Clear running waters blowing to the greatness, the trees on the hill. Spirit of God and the finger of morning fill the air, bring it to the bird and blow. Blow to life be, but the breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Blow, blow, blow to life be, but the breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Down in the meadow, the cattle are lowing, the sheep in the pasture land. Cannot lie still. Spirit of God, creation is groaning. Fill the earth, bring it to birth, and blow where you will. Blow, blow, blow 
what a life be but breath of the spirit blowing in me blow 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 to life be but breath of the spirit blowing in me spirit of god every man's heart is groaning watching and waiting and hungry until Spirit of God, man longs that you only fill the earth, bring it to birth and blow where you will. Blow, blow, blow till I be but breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Blow, blow, blow till I be breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Blow, blow, blow to I be. Breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Blow, blow, blow to I be. Breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Holy Spirit. Blow, 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 blow to light me, breath of the Spirit blowing in me. Blow, 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 Holy Spirit, fill the earth, fill our hearts, fill our minds, that we may worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. We worship you. Hallelujah. 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 Jehovah God. You are everything, Lord. Without you, we are nothing. You are a supply alone. You supply our every need. All healing comes from you, Lord. You're the one who gives us peace, Lord. You are our shepherd. Hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign, and you will never change your Lord, forever you're the same. Hallowed be thy name, Jehovah God, you reign. change your Lord forever you're the same Jehovah Jireh you supply my every need Jehovah Rapha perfect health you give to me be thy name, Jehovah God, you reign, and you will never change, your oh Lord, forever you're the same, Jehovah Shalom, you're the one who gives me peace. Jehovah Rohi, my faithful shepherd leading me. Hallowed be thy name. 
Jehovah God, you reign. And you will never change, the Lord. Forever you the same. Hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign, and you will never change, O oh Lord, forever you're the same. Salaam Alaikum. That means peace be with you. And if you were to meet an Arab, I live in an Arabic nation. The first thing an Arab would say to you are these words. Shalom Aleichem, which means peace be with you. And if you were to meet a Jew, these are the first words that he would say to you. Peace be with you. And it's rather ironic, isn't it? That the people who wish us peace the most are not very peaceful at this moment in time. But these are the most important words that we can wish somebody, because if there is one thing that we need in our lives, it is peace. Everything is in turmoil around us. Everything is in turmoil within us. And we just have to examine what's happening in the world and what's happening with us to realize the truth of this. We have personal struggles. There are mental issues, there's anxiety, there's worry, there is doubt, there's stress. Things that can literally drive us mad. We go through identity crisis. We don't know who we are. We don't know where we're headed. We're constantly having self-doubt. We look into the mirror and we don't see a person that we like. Then we are fearful of the future. The future looms right ahead and we kind of don't know which path to take. We don't know what lies on the path that we take. And there is, of course, guilt and shame of our sinful lives, the things that we've done in the past, mistakes that we've regretted so many times over and over again. But there are residues of guilt and shame that trouble us, that plague us, and that take our peace away. And then, of course, there are other things also that take away our peace. One of them are relational conflicts. We have disturbance in our family relationships, spouses with spouses, parents with children, brothers with brothers, sisters with sisters. And it seems that all we do sometimes in a family is fight. Is that not true? In our society, there are disturbances. In our workplaces, there are disturbances. We don't get along with our colleagues. We don't get along with our bosses. And if we're a boss, we don't get along with our employees. And forget about all these people, all these things in the world. There is conflict even in our churches with people jockeying for power and positions of importance. And there is disturbance there as well. Yeah, the one place you thought you might find solace, the one place you thought you might find peace, peace is notable notably absent. And then, of course, we have global, con global conflicts, which all of us are aware. There is there are political instability in so many nations in the world right now. There are economic fears, economic worries, you know. <laughs> Unemployment is at its highest in most countries in the world, and job security is not there, which means security of money is not there. So we're constantly worried about how are we going to look after ourselves? How are we going to look after our families? How are we going to look after things around us? And then there's the environmental factor. There is global warming, and it's creating devastating effects around the world. Countries which never used to see rainfall are experiencing floods. And that's the least of it. Of course, there are wars and famines and all kinds of other natural disasters. Then there is technological fears. You know, we have artificial intelligence rearing its ugly head now, rearing its, its whatever head it is. And it's creating a lot of fear in us about what's the future going to hold in store for us. Nowadays, you can do anything through AI. You can, you can change, you can mimic my face, you can mimic my voice. My mom can get a call from me or someone who sounds like me 
telling her that I'm in great trouble and I need some money urgently, would she please send it over? And because my voice is my voice and she thinks that she's talking to me, she will not hesitate to send the money. Yeah, but the fact is, it's not me. It's somebody else pretending to be me. And that's a warning for all of you to be cautious. <laughs> and if, you know, you are at peace, now that's going to disturb your peace a little bit. And then, of course, there is the spiritual disturbance, temptation constantly, spiritual, spiritual attacks constantly, the devil telling us God does not love you, the devil telling us you're never going to be holy, the devil constantly, constantly, constantly messing about with your heart, with your mind, and with your lives. So, I think I've covered a lot of things, and I'm sure that you can relate to most of these things that I've spoken about, if not all. And so, what's the need of the hour? The need of the hour is peace, but not peace the way we understand it when we look at the word in English. What we need is shalom. And what Shalom does is it encompasses a lot of things. It speaks about completeness. It speaks about wholeness. It speaks about harmony. It speaks about well-being. And that is the kind of peace that God wants to give us, not just the calm and not just the quiet, but a peace that pervades every aspect of our lives. And as we learned last week, when we call him Jehovah Rapha, it's not just a God who heals, it's also a God who restores, a God who repairs, a God who mends, a God who fixes. Today we're going to meet Jehovah Shalom, the God who's going to give us supernatural peace so that it doesn't matter what's happening around us. We will be at peace. And if your hearts are open, and I truly hope they are, before this session is over, you are going to experience this peace that comes only from God, that can come only from God. And <clears throat> all we need to do is to meet him. So are you ready to meet him? Well, if you are, then <clears throat> open your Bibles to uh, Judges chapter 6, please. I'm going to get it on my screen here. But you know the rules. Um, you need to open it in your own Bibles and read it for yourselves, because after the session is over, I want you to open to this passage, and I want you to read it, and I want you to think about everything that we spoke about today, so that it is fully integrated in your lives, all right? And trust me when I tell you, listening to me is one thing, reading it for yourself is another thing, and reading it with the understanding that you're about to get is a third thing, and I want you to have it all. Say so, amen, to so praise the Lord. Peace be with you. <clears throat> the Israelites, I hope you like scripture because we're going to do a lot of scripture today and this passage is going to be particularly long. And if you don't like scripture and you want peace, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. I'm going to pause there. Keep your, keep your Bibles open to this passage because we're not done with it. I want to tell you about a common thing that has happened throughout Israelite history. There were moments of, there were times of great prosperity. They enjoyed the blessings of God. But instead of turning toward God, instead of coming closer to Him, instead of being grateful for the tremendous blessings that they received, they started doing whatever they wanted to do. And what does that mean? They did evil. They did things that were not pleasing to God. And they continued doing that. Why not? The blessings were there. Who needs God anymore? Big mistake. Because when we do that, when the Israelites did that, we're going to stick to them since we're talking about them. I'll come to us in a moment. 
When the Israelites did that, God would remove his hand of blessing and the Israelites would come upon hard times. Just like what you just read. And these are terrible times, miserable times. When they came upon these hard times, they did what they always did, which is to turn to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, we need you. And then the Lord, because he is merciful and because he's compassionate, he forgives them and he restores them and he blesses them again. And then what happens? They enjoy the blessings for a little bit. They thank God for a little bit and then return to their old habits of sinfulness. And now we come to us. Don't we do the same? God loves us so much. God blesses us so much. But instead of coming closer to him and saying, thank you, Lord, we want to continue to be blessed by you because you're the only one who can bless us. We forget about the blesser and focus on the blessings, turning to a life of sin until we come upon hard times. And then the entire cycle repeats itself ad nauseum. The blessings, the rebellion, the struggle, the repentance, the restoration, and back to the blessings. Now, the good news is, and there always is good news because I'm an optimist. And why am I an optimist? I'm an optimist because I have the greatest God in the universe as my God. And you need to be optimistic too, because this God is your God too. The good news is that we are right now in human history at a time of struggle, at a time when everything around us is falling apart, at a time when we're beginning to realize, and if we don't realize it yet, we will realize it very soon, that the only way out of our strife, out of our difficulties, out of this global situation is to turn towards God. And when we turn towards God, he's going to restore us and he's going to bless us. So we're in very soon for a time of blessings. And I believe that these will be tremendous blessings. But in order to get there, we need to turn to God as the Israelites did. Let's continue with the story. I'm going to keep this on the screen until I'm done, until I'm done dissecting this. When the Israelites cried out to God, this is Judges 6, verse 7, for anyone who's just joined us. Please open your Bibles to Judges chapter 6, verse 7. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Now, I got a little passionate over there, and the reason I got passionate is because all prophets are passionate. Can you imagine giving someone a scolding with a smile on your face? You have to be stern with people and make them come to the realization of the errors of their ways. And if you're not able to make people come to that realization that what they're doing is wrong, what they're doing is sinful, and that they need to turn to God, you're a pretty crappy prophet, aren't you? And so listen to the tone of these words here. It's a warning. It's a stern warning. And he's saying, God has done so much for you people. God has delivered you from slavery. God has taken, you to the, has taken you to the promised land. God has blessed you with so much. And what do you do? You turn to false gods. And isn't that what we do? Too. Sunday we worship God. We go to our churches and do whatever we do in our churches. And the rest of the week... He is far away from our minds. He is far away from our hearts. And you want to test that? How much time do you spend with God? Outside of that church service that you go to. But you're busy, no? 
You're busy looking after your family. You're busy providing for your family. You're busy working. You're busy making a name for yourself. You're busy accumulating wealth. You're busy doing this and doing that and doing that. And whatever you spend most of your time with is your God. Whatever you give most importance to is your God. Idols are not just things you make out of clay. Idols are anything that takes precedence over God, and we all have idols in our lives. And so this story about the Israelites is actually a story about us. And don't be fooled by my smile. I'm still scolding. I just, I just like to smile because nothing can take the joy away from me. So let's continue. The angel, this is verse 11. I hope you all are on your Bibles. I use the NIV. Uh, I, I like the language in it, and I really recommend that, that you get, doesn't matter what, I'm not telling you to, to drop your Bible into the sea um, or to, to, to keep it aside, but, but um, it's always a good idea to have different versions. Behind me, I got about six different versions of the Bible, so I, I pick up all of them. And, and read the Word of God. I get different understanding from the different ways they've translated the Bible, and it's wonderful when we can do that. Okay, so in, in the interest of understanding Scripture easily, the NIV is beautiful, plus you'll be able to follow with me, okay? The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak and Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, what do you do in a wine press? You press grapes, right, to make wine. What is Gideon doing in a wine press? He's threshing wheat. Why is he threshing wheat in a wine press? Because he can't thresh wheat on the outside because the enemies would see him threshing wheat and come and kill him and destroy all the wheat. So he has to do all his work hidden in a wine press. And I want us to think about that too. I want us to think about every point that I make over here because these are points not about people who lived so many years ago. These are all points about us. Let's continue. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon goes, what? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I'm hiding like a chicken in a wine press. <laughs> yeah, threshing wheat. Because I'm scared of the Midianites and the Amicalites and all those assorted bozos who are for my life. Me, mighty warrior. <laughs> hey, you know what? God is saying to you, mighty warrior. What does Gideon say? Probably the same thing that you're saying right now, right? Pardon me, my Lord. <laughs> but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of Midian. And don't you ask the same question? We're Christians, right? Inheritors of great promises, right? God has said, I will give you abundant life, right? And so where is the abundant life? I keep singing about God being the miracle worker, the promise keeper, and the rest of it. But where is this God that I keep talking about and singing about and hearing about? Where is he? And you need to ask this question. God doesn't mind. God doesn't mind. Trust me, he doesn't mind. I know him. Because there are times in my life I've asked him where he was. Times I've said, you made all these promises to me. I've said, you made all these promises to the church. You made all these promises to believers. And where are you, Lord? Why is the devil triumphing? Why is there so much of bloodshed in this world? Why is there so much of evil? Why is there so much of crime? What are you doing, Lord? And haven't you asked it? Be honest. Be honest about your doubts. Be honest about... About, about the things you wonder of God. Gideon was. He asked a question that was in everybody's mind. Lord, you promised me this. You promised us abundance. You promised us glory. You promised us riches. And we are hiding like, 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 like cowards. But 
The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? <laughs> the Lord said, All right, you're wondering where I am. I'm here. And you want me to work? I need human beings to work with, and I've chosen you. He's not talking about Gideon now, he's talking to you. I've chosen you. Me? Go ahead. Go ahead, ask God me. <laughs> me, I'm a clock in a bank. I'm a secretary to some big shot, but a secretary nonetheless. I have a business, but it's small and it's struggling. I'm a homebody. I'm just a housewife who doesn't know anything but to cook and to look after the kids and to sweep off after my husband, who's this lazy bozo, doesn't do anything. <laughs> who are you? Again, be honest. Be honest. God appreciates honesty. It's better to say who we are and doubt our ability to do anything than to pretend we're something and not do anything. So the Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And Gideon replies, Pardon me, Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. Um, I'm the least of the least. I'm good for nothing. <laughs> Don't you have any better people to send? The Lord answered, I will be with you. And he will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Go do what you have to. You want signs that God is with you? Do you want to know if God is really talking to you tonight? And every night that you attend this particular service, Ask him for a sign. Ask him for a sign. He understands. I've always asked him for signs, especially when he asked me to do ridiculous things. I've always asked him because how do I know it's God and how do I not know it's, it's that devil who wants me to fall on my face and make a fool of myself. So I ask him for signs and he always provides, as he did to Gideon. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of his staff, tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire fled out from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Can you imagine a personal encounter with God? Yeah, there is debate about whether the angel of the Lord was really God or was he an angel. Um, I believe there was God talking to Gideon there as God is talking to you. And he uses sometimes different forms, but we have to understand and realize that God talks to us in various ways. But here Gideon is convinced it was God because he's afraid, because he knew that to look upon the face of God, and in the old days this was a commandment, you cannot look upon the face of God and survive. You look upon the face of God and you're a dead man. I think that's Exodus 33, 20. <clears throat> so Gideon is afraid. Yeah, I've seen God and I'm going to be struck dead now. And the Lord said to him, As the Lord is saying to you, peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Shalom. Not peace the way we understand it in English. Shalom the way it is understood in Hebrew. 
And he's not just telling Gideon to be at peace. He's giving Gideon supernatural peace. Please listen very carefully to what I am saying to you here tonight. Because God is not just going to let our hearts and minds and will be at peace. He's not going to say your life is going to be at peace. He is saying, I am giving you peace right now. Supernatural peace. We sing that song. We've been singing it almost every week in our sessions. It's a song that goes, Yahweh, Rafa, Yahweh, Rafa, Elohim, Shaddai, Chaira, Adonai, will manifest himself. And then it continues, Your glory, will manifest in this place. Lord, you're doing something great. Awaken supernatural faith. And that's what happens when we are with God, that he's not interested in giving us ordinary faith. He wants to give us supernatural faith so that we listen to the things that he says and believe in what he says implicitly. That we live lives of freedom without doubt. That we live lives of freedom without struggles. That we live lives of freedom that truly allows us to live in abundance. And over here when he says, peace. Awaken supernatural peace. I'm giving you supernatural peace. Please understand. And then he says, do not be afraid. And do not be afraid. That you have looked upon the face of God and are going to die, but do not be afraid about anything. Be fearless. Because I've chosen you. I've selected you. Out of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people, I've chosen you, Gideon. Don't be afraid. You are not going to die. Not only are you not going to die because you've gazed upon my face, you're not going to die in battle either. In fact, you are going to live forever. Your name spoken about forever. And this is what God is saying to you, my brothers and sisters. Do not be afraid. You're not going to die. And in our case, our case, it's a little more than what Gideon got. And we're going to come to that in a few moments, but let's finish this now. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, and he called it, The Lord <coughs> is Peace. And he called it, what did he call it? I'm going to close this now so that you can see my face and give me your undivided attention. He called it, The Lord is Peace. Gideon has not gone to war yet. Gideon has not won any battles yet, but he's declaring who his God is and who is his God. His God is the creator of the universe, but he's also the God of peace. A God who gives peace to troubled minds, a God who gives peace to restless hearts, a God who gives peace to purposeless lives. A God who tells us not to be afraid because he is with us. And Gideon builds that altar to let everyone in his village, to let everyone in his tribe, to let all of Israel know that the Lord is peace and he is with them. And the Lord is peace and he's with you. But you say, where? God spoke these words to Gideon. Why doesn't he say them to us? And 2,000 years ago, the Prince of Peace said these words. Peace. My peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. I do not give as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. 
The prophet Isaiah, who we'll t- talk about a lot, prophesied about Jesus. He said, to us, a child is born. And he should be called a number of titles, and among one of the titles is the Prince of Peace. And when the Prince of Peace, the ruler of peace, the person who controls peace, the person who is peace, when he gives us peace, (laughs) what do you think he gives us? Peace for a little while? Peace for a few moments? Peace, you come over here and you sing a song and... You feel your heart at peace, and the moment the song is over, you go into the world, and there you are. What am I going to do tomorrow? My boss is about to fire me. What am I going to do tomorrow? My husband's about to leave me. What am I going to do tomorrow? I cannot pay my bill and my toss me in jail. What am I going to do tomorrow? And the worries just come back, hitting us like a boomerang that we just kicked out a little while ago. This is not the peace that God wants us to have. He wants us to be complete. He wants us to be whole. He wants us to be in harmony. He wants us to be well. I spoke about the soul last week, about the mind constantly disturbed, constantly in turmoil. I spoke about the heart constantly, constantly bruised, constantly wounded. I spoke about the will constantly making wrong choices, wrong decisions. And God wants to fix all of that. He wants to bless all of us with peace and he can do that. The world can be in turmoil. People can continue to kill each other as they have been doing for centuries. Bombs can keep flying. They can burst right outside the house. But if we have the peace of God, we don't need circumstances to determine that peace. We're at peace because the Lord is peace (laughs) and the Lord is with us. How many times have you had the Lord be with you? (laughs) And what do you say? Also with you. The Lord is peace, no? So what are we saying? We might not say Salaam Alaikum, and we might not say Shalom Alaikum, but we are saying the Lord is with you, and the Lord is peace. So where is that peace? There was, um, there was, I'm not going to look at the clock. I'm just going to go on um, because, because I think peace is worth it, no? All the time that we spend, so don't write to me afterwards and say you should stick to one hour or whatever. I'm not going to listen to you, okay? So two artists were commissioned to paint a picture of peace. And one of the artists made a beautiful picture depicting a lake that was very calm, mountains in the background, a sea that was blue, birds flying, a family enjoying a picnic, by the beach and it was beautiful i mean he looked at it and he said oh that's 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 a picture that really uh, captured the essence of peace the second artist however drew a very similar scene of a sea and mountains in the sky but to look at it was dark the clouds were black there was lightning cutting its way through the sky the sea was rough it was churning wicked waves threatening to drown There was nobody on the beach. It was just just very still. But in a little cave on the mountainside, a small little bird was singing its bird song. And the judges decided that this was the winner of the two pictures because it is easy to have peace when everything is tranquil. But true peace is having peace in the middle of a storm. And as believers, as Christians, as people who believe that the Lord is peace, we should be like that little bird singing its bird song even in the middle of trial. And those who have understood God, those who know God, and one of the reasons we've been doing the series on the names of God is the more we know God, the more faith we can have in Him. We also will sing. Now, there were two men, Paul and Silas, who lived in the time after Jesus, and one day they were beaten, beaten with metal rods. They were thrown into a dungeon, dark and dismal and dirty, with their feet tied in stocks and their hands in chains. And you know what they did? In all that stormy darkness, they opened their mouths, and like that little bird, they sang praises to God. That is how we should 
be my brothers and sisters. And I hope that as you're listening to this talk, and that's the power of the Word of God, as you're listening to this talk, you're starting to understand what Paul and Silas felt and understood when they were in that tunnel, that it doesn't matter what's going on around you. As long as you have Jesus in you, you have peace. So if you don't have peace, what does it mean? Now, Jesus was peace. Okay, I'm going to take you to Scripture again for a beautiful story. I'm not going to, going to spend too much time on it. But I want you to, to read this for yourself and mark it. Mark chapter 4, please. Uh, mark chapter 4. Let me get it on the screen. Um, yeah, verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. I'm going to read this very fast now because uh, even though I told you that thing about the time, I, I, want to finish, uh, I want to finish this soon. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. The furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. <laughs> what kind of a man sleeps in a storm? And this was a bad storm because it was about to capsize the boat. Let me repeat the question. What kind of a man sleeps in the middle of a storm? Only a man who is in total control. Only a man who is in total peace. Jesus was totally at peace. I wonder if the boat had capsized, if he still would have been at peace, he probably would have been. Why? Because he knew that nothing could happen without the will of God. Please listen to me very carefully. How were Paul and Silas able to be a total peace in that dark dungeon? Because they knew that nothing could happen outside the will of God in their lives. And even if that to go through a storm, even if that to be beaten up, even if that to be tortured, even if they had to be killed. It was all in the will of God. Jesus told the apostles, let's go over to the other side. Jesus knew everything that was going to happen. Jesus knew that even though they were in the storm, they were also in the will of God. And just that understanding will give you peace right now. Just that understanding. So I'm going to repeat it to you. Do you trust God? Yeah, Paul tells us. Paul tells us that whatever happens, whatever happens, know that God is going to make good come out of it. And if you have that, Romans 8, 28, let's open our Bibles to that. Hang on a second. Yeah, Romans, there's mana coming out today. This, none of this is Rios, by the way, yeah? Yeah, Romans 8, 28, let me get it on the screen here. And I want you to repeat it after me, yeah? And we know, say, and we know, <laughs> that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let that sink in. We know that in all things, your building might be hit by a bomb now if you're living in Lebanon, okay? The entire thing might come to the ground. But if you know, if you know that in all things, in all things, God works for our good, it doesn't matter what happens, you will say, praise the Lord. And that is where the peace comes from. And that is why Paul and Silas were not bothered about anything because they knew they were in the will of God. So, bad things happen in this world, guys. Yeah. I, re I watch the news, and I'm not happy with what happens. But I'm the most unhappy, other than, of course, the violence and the bloodshed and innocents dying, is, is that these people 
live disturbed and die disturbed. Whereas the believer in Christ need not live disturbed and die disturbed either. Because whatever happens is in the will of God. I've gone through a lot of crap in my life, and it always used to bother me until I found Christ. And once I found Christ, either he's in charge or not. And if he's in charge, then what do I have to worry about? He spoke about him as Adonai, Lord and Master. If he's my master, he has a responsibility to look after me. If he's Elohim and the creator of this world, there's nothing that happens that he doesn't know. So he's in control, and if he's in control, then what do I need to worry and break my head about? Are you listening to me? Does that mean I can do whatever I want? No, it doesn't. He will correct me if he sees that I'm doing something I shouldn't do. As he corrected the Israelites, as he's correcting the world right now. But even in the correction, I know that he's there with me and he's not going to forsake me. And that is what I want us to understand. That peace comes from this Security in knowing that he is a wonderful God who loves me. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. And although I know it by heart, I want to read it to you. So let's open our Bibles to, to Philippians. Uh, let me get it on the screen too. Philippians um, chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. This is for all you anxious people there. If the session ends and you're still anxious, if you're still worried, then you've not been listening to me. So watch the talk again and again. And again until it sinks into your heads and your hearts, more importantly. Because anxiety and worry is not for the Christian believer. Let me repeat that. Anxiety and worry is not for the Christian believer. So do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let me take it off the screen. Look at me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What is it saying? What is Paul saying? He's saying you have an anxiety? You have a worry? Yes, you do, do have a worry. You to get anxious about stuff. What do you do? You want to worry about it more and more? Stress yourself out more and more? Talk yourself into an early grave? He's saying, hey, go to, go to God. Tell him what you need. Thank him. Give him a hug. And then go away in peace. And people find this very simplistic. So I'm going to tell you a little story of what used to happen when my daughter was little. She would come to me sometimes and say, Dad, I need some money for a class picnic or some class activity the next week. And I would say, okay, baby. And she'd give me a tight hug and play without a care in the world, even though I did not give her the money. Why? Because she knew that as a father, on the day she needed the money, she would have it. And so she could be at peace. Now, <laughs> Paul asks, Paul says rather, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. 
Now, if we are children of God, then is there anything that our Father cannot do for us? If I, as a human father, love my daughter with my limited love, to be able to take care of her, <clears throat> to be able to provide her, and she trusts me, even though I'm just a human being, how much more should we trust our God to whom nothing is impossible? And so do you see the simplicity of it? That instead of worrying and breaking my head about things I have no control over, I go to my God and say, Father, I have this problem. And I don't know what to do about it. And today I went to him with a problem and I said, I don't know what to do about it, but I trust you because you're a great God and you're a mighty God. And I don't know why I'm going through this, but I'm leaving it in, into your hands and I'm at peace. Ta-da! <laughs> so you have a choice now. You want to worry? You want to be anxious? You want to die early? I want to dying early is not a bad thing, but you want to suffer <laughs> while you die. Yeah, on your deathbed, all you're going to be do, doing is grumbling and talking about about the bad stuff that's happened in your life. This is now what God wants for us, guys, and we really need to understand that. This is not what I want for you. I want you to, to have peace. And this is not somebody just talking about stuff because he's read it somewhere. All these things I talk about are experience for the most part. And so I talk about them with certainty. I don't talk about them, you know, kind of, it might happen, might not. I know it is going to happen. And like I said, this is shalom peace. It's not... Peace, peace, the way we understand it, it's shalom, it it's encompasses everything. So let's look at a few things that Jesus has done, and then we're going to end with, with whatever song Brother Mervyn chooses to sing. And he's going to continue singing that, and through that song, I'd like to think that, actually, let's just sing Hallowed Be Thy Name again. And I'm telling you that through, through just proclaiming the names of God, and understanding what we have learned about him through these past few lessons, we're going to get it. We've still got time, Brother Marvin, five minutes or ten minutes. So let's look at the ways that Jesus brings us peace. One, I can hear him stringing that thing. Everything's working. <laughs> One, he brings us peace with God. How? We were at God's enemies, but through his death and resurrection, for those of us who believe in him, he brings the peace of reconciliation with our Father. As we've already seen, we can call ourselves children of the mightiest being in the universe. Just think that for a moment. Just think that for a moment. I got God as my Father. <laughs> I'll, I'll be a fool if I worry about it. <laughs> really, I mean, think about it for a moment. So, peace, instant peace. Second thing is our peace for my, for my soul, that I know that I have forgiveness. So many of us carry guilt and shame with us for things that we've done in the distant past, things we've repented for, still not understanding that when Jesus forgives, he forgives completely. It's like you never committed the sin, and people around you can point their finger at you, the devil can point his finger at you. You can point a finger at you, stop it, it doesn't matter, because you're forgiven. And that forgiveness brings so much of peace to know that I am forgiven. Go ahead, tell God you're sorry, go ahead. You did something an hour ago, what you shouted at your wife, tell God you're sorry. You lied about something earlier in the day? Tell God you're sorry. Whatever you did, tell God you're sorry. Accept his forgiveness and be at peace. You see how easy it is? Yeah. He brings calm in the storm. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. Now you have to understand he is in control. And if he's in control, then you don't have to fear anything. You don't have to worry about anything. So be at peace and always think of that little bird singing bird song in the cave, in the mountain, in the middle of a storm, and say, I'm going to be like that little birdie, and I'm going to sing my own bird song. 
even if I don't sing very well. Then we're at peace with others. If I'm at peace, I can be at peace with my neighbors. I can be at peace with the people around me. But if I'm constantly agitated, then I cannot be at peace with anybody because I'm not at peace with myself. But if you're at peace with yourself, you can be at peace with everybody. And you need to be at peace with everybody because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And you want to be more blessed than you already are, you start becoming a peacemaker. Don't hold anything against anyone. I've forgiven everybody, all my offenders. And if anyone of my enemies, I don't like to think of them as such, but I know that they do come and stretch their hand towards me. I'll ignore the hand. You know why? Because I'm going to give them the tightest huggy buggy they've ever received. <laughs> enemies listening? Some of them show up for these meetings to see who else is here listening to me. <laughs> then we have peace of mind, you know. I spoke about anxiety and worry and the rest of it, but you just remember Philippians 4, 6 to 7, and don't be anxious about anything. And so my mind is at rest. Yeah, so you see how God looks at it holistically. And then I have eternal peace. I spoke about Gideon and not being afraid, yeah, but because, because nobody was going to kill him, but of course he was going to die at some point. But for us, when we die, we don't really die because we live forever. And nothing can take that away from us. Nothing can take that away from us. Don't let anybody tell you that, you know, you constantly need to be frightened about whether you're going to heaven or you're going to hell. You say, but I commit sins. Yes, I know. God knows. And he's factored your sins into, into his plans for your life. It's not like you, you, you commit a sin, like that lie you, you said today. <laughs> you think he didn't know that you're going to lie? But he also knew that tonight, when you listen to me, you're going to repent for that. And the moment you repent, you're forgiven. So, so slate is clean. And I want us to have this. Paul wanted us to have this. He said, remember that the work that God started in you, he will complete. Yeah, the salvation. Who saved you? You didn't save yourself. And if you save yourself, start re rethinking your, 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 your faith. God saved you. He saved you. He started it. And he who began a work in you will carry it to completion. I think that's Philippians 1.6. I'm not going to bring it up on the screen, but make a note of it. It's a very powerful verse that should assure all of us of eternal life. And if that isn't enough, Jesus says, I've sealed you with my Holy Spirit. Yeah, as a sign that you're mine, as a sign that you're God's child. And nothing is going to take that away. Nothing is going to separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. Nothing, 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 nothing. You're worried, no, sometimes? Yeah, because the devil tells you, oh, how many times are you going to do that? Now God doesn't love you anymore. What kind of God do you think he is? A petty God who's going to, going to, going to take offense at every little thing? He's a father. He's your father. And he is love. He is love. Forget about he knows how to love or he can love. He is love, just like he is peace. And so, so be at peace over there too. <laughs> He's given us that Holy Spirit. And we have peace through the Holy Spirit. One of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is peace. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And as long as we're with Christ, as long as we're living close to him, as long as we're not just Sunday Christians who go to church once a week, but are constant in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit starts to move, the Holy Spirit starts to flow. You're listening to a powerful word of God today, and what do you think the Holy Spirit is doing? Even if he was dormant in you for days, I'm telling you, he started to flow now. And as he flows, as he flows, he's bringing you not just Peace is bringing you supernatural peace. The peace that leaves you undisturbed. It doesn't, not uncaring, not uncaring. Yeah, that you should care about what's happening in the world and where you have the power to fix it. You must fix it. If your families are broken, start to repair it with God's help. And sometimes you might need to wait for the right time because whoever you're estranged with is not talking to you. But as long as you have the supernatural peace in you, the ability to reconcile, he will give you the opportunities to reconcile. But remember, he's also working in other people's lives. 
right? So they, they might not be ready for the reconciliation at this moment in time. But you always, always be ready to reconcile. And then you have peace because of your new identity. I already told you you're a child of God. I don't know about you, man, but <laughs> there's nothing that gives me so much peace as knowing that God is my father. Ah. Elohim is my father. Yahweh is my father. Adonai is my father. Jehovah Rapha is my father. Jehovah Shalom is my father. Jehovah Sikanu is my father. Jehovah Saba is my father. And we're going to sing his names. That's all we're going to do. And maybe Brother Moran can take the song twice. And all you have to do, <laughs> forget about everything now. Really forget about everything and just know that you're a child of God. You're a child of this God that we sing about now. Hallowed be his name. Hallowed be thy name Jehovah God you reign And you will never change Lord Forever you're the same be thy name, Jehovah God you reign, and you will never change, Lord, forever you're the same, Jehovah Jireh, you supply Jehovah Rapha, perfect health you give to me. Jehovah Jireh, you supply my every need. Jehovah Rapha, perfect health you give to me. Hallowed be thy name, Jehovah God, you reign, and you will never change, O oh Lord, forever you're the same, Jehovah Shalom, you're the one who gives me Jehovah Rohi, my faithful shepherd leading me. Jehovah Shalom, you're the one who gives me peace. Jehovah Rohi, my faithful shepherd leading me. be thy name, Jehovah God you reign, and you will never change, oh Lord, forever you're the same, Jehovah Kadesh, you're the one who makes me clean. Jehovah Sikhenu, imparting righteousness to me. Jehovah Kadesh, you're the one who makes me clean. Jehovah Sikhenu, imparting righteousness to me. 
imparting righteousness to me. Hallowed be thy name. Jehovah God, you reign. And you will never change, Lord. Forever you're the same. Jehovah, me see. Lord, you reign in victory. Jehovah Shama, you are always there for me. Jehovah Nisi, Lord, you reign in victory. Jehovah Shama, you are always there. be thy name Jehovah God you reign and you will never change oh Lord forever you're the same keep your eyes closed I know that this God that we've been singing about, that this God we've been describing, is with us now. He's closer to us than he was with Gideon, with Moses, with any of these great people that we read about in the Bible. He's closer to us because he dwells within us through his Holy Spirit. Take a moment to absorb that truth about our faith. That we have God himself within us. And if God is within us, then everything we read or hear about God is within us. The Lord is peace. We have this peace already. It is not something that he has to give us from the outside. It is something that is within us that needs to be released into our soul into our troubled mind, our anxious heart, our broken will. Release it now. Let it flow. Surrender yourself to God. Surrender yourself to his will, to his desire to do what God desires in you. And as he flows... If we allow him to flow unchecked, he will flow out of us into this troubled world around us, bringing peace to those who live with us. Peace to those we work with. Peace to those we study with. Peace in our neighborhoods. Peace in our communities. Peace in our churches. And peace in the world. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and we are his brothers and his sisters. And we might not be the Prince of Peace in the way that he is understood to be, but we are princes and princesses of peace if we desire to be, taking God's peace into the entire world, and blessed are the peacemakers, for they are truly children of God. So even as God is letting his peace flow through us here tonight, let us understand that he's calling us to let this peace flow out into this world that is so broken, so chaotic, so troubled.
God is also bringing healing here tonight. To relationships. Relationships at your home. You will find your spouse suddenly seems different from what they were a few hours ago. He's bringing healing in our workplaces. And you will go to work tomorrow, the beginning of a new week. And you'll feel like it's a beginning of, it's a, it's a newness to everything. He's also healing bodies, even as we're praying now. Taking away the headaches that stress used to bring us. Taking away the ulcers that anxiety caused in us. Taking away pain because we've started to trust more in his love and his mercy. There is so much of healing here tonight. Let us know that it doesn't need to end here tonight. That every day, especially in the week that comes, as we dwell on the message that was heard here tonight, that the Lord is peace, we will continue to experience great things in our lives. All in Jesus' name, for the great glory of God. Amen. Open your eyes. I hope they were closed. <laughs> so let's end with a song of thanksgiving. We come before you today. And there's just something that I want to say. to me for all the blessings that I cannot see thank you Lord thank you Lord with a grateful heart with a song of praise with an outstretched arm I miss your name the shadow I've been the shadow I've been the shadow I've been the shadow